everyone, I'm Roma Tunison, and welcome to Curated Conversations, the official podcast series of the Middle East's premier retail and consumer insights hub, Curated Middle East. Curated Conversations is a dynamic platform dedicated to bringing you insightful, high-value industry information that focuses specifically on the evolving landscape in the MENA region. Join us as we speak to some of the region's most prominent movers and shakers as they share their knowledge, experiences, and stories to help you navigate all of the changes we face in the industry today. Hi everyone, and welcome to this special edition of Curated Conversations. Today's episode is dedicated to addressing one of the most talked about themes in the Middle Eastern luxury industry right now, diversity and the Arab perspective. It is my absolute pleasure to be joined by two formidable women, Sophia Gulati and Miriam Jalouat, who individually are industry experts in their own right, but together they are the brains behind Mealworld.com the proudly Arab, digitally focused luxury title that is internationally acclaimed for creating content with a uniquely Arab perspective. Sophia and Miriam, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Roma. How have you been? Are you guys back at work? Yeah, we've never left work, (laughs) so we cannot be back. We're, we're 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 at our best right now where we the the, the force of meal was always from the beginning to uh, work remotely wherever we are we could make it happen and right now Sophia is in her beautiful Tunisia in Sidi Bou Said and I am in France I just left UAE uh, luckily on the 13th of July and okay. uh, I'm in France, in the French Alps, uh, but we both are working until we take some, a little bit of time off in August. Amazing. Yeah. And where is uh, the rest of the team? Are they still in Dubai or are they also still split up kind of working remotely from no, wherever they are? We're, yeah, we're all over the place, to be honest. Like uh, uh, Amina and Sarah, our writers, uh, are in uh, Tunis right now. Uh, Samira is in the UK. Um, we have so many people all across the world, like uh, Ala, our translator, is in, uh, is in Dubai. So we're, we're all over the, the map. That's amazing. Which we love, which we love because it shows also that people can think that when you work remotely, there is no maturity or efficiency to the work you bring to your client or your partners. And it's been an absolute pleasure and, and journey for the past three years to actually make it happen that way. It's even more efficient. You guys have always kind of had this framework. So it, was, it probably wasn't that big of a shock to your system when everything locked down because you were already so efficient in working uh, without actually being in the same space, correct? And you're right on saying that we didn't see much change, although I was telling Sophia yesterday in one of our calls Mm-hmm. taking a step back and reflecting on the difficult time we've been all living, we, all, we are all in the same state right now. But the first month was a struggle, understanding how personally, mentally, people were trying to get back to a normal, a new norm, sorry, of working. And then suddenly after a month, thanks to Sofia, thanks to the team, I realized that, like you said, we've always been doing this. I think it. I think for a lot of people, it just opened up new channels, gave you the time to think and become really innovative and, you know, kind of hone in on how to do things even better than they were before. Absolutely. It's, it's true for the whole world to reassess priorities, to reshift, uh, to reshift priorities and, um, and to rethink uh, about a new way of... of, of uh, of living even, you know what I mean? Like whether it's in the workspace or in the personal space. And I think that's why people now are getting, uh, are getting a bit more vocal about, about the state of the world. You have movements like Me Too in Egypt that are, you know, that are, that are rising. And I think, uh, I think it's due to, to this coronavirus contemplation or meditation, you know what I mean? So while we're on that topic, Sophia, I'm just going to go right into it. So the Hire More Arabs movement has been the talk of the industry since it exploded on social media last week. 
mm-hmm. being such established and respected industry personalities and being oh that's sweet i don't know if that's true but thank you it's the absolute truth i'm gonna i'm reason. gonna i'm gonna think that it's true it's absolutely <laughs> true anyone you speak to they know who you are and they love you and Aww. being arabs yourself you know like i really wanted to kind of start off by getting your thoughts on the movement like what do you think of it it's just started last week so it's the talk of the town right now what are your thoughts on it you know what i i have no particular thought on it let me tell you why because for me it's a question of no, like for us uh and i was thinking in preparation of this podcast i was like did we create mail and did we hire only arabs because it was a sort of uh counter proposal to what's available in the UAE and it's not even the case because it came so naturally to us like uh, roma like would you hire uh, french uh, editors in france yeah you yeah. know it wasn't even a question for us you know it's not even like a, some sort of statement that we want to make um so the higher more arab movement i have no thoughts about it because this is how we've been thinking for years and also this is a conversation that has been happening uh, if you want to give more co- context to your audience you know because it's been um it's 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 been a long time that fashion uh, i mean english uh, media that uh, pertain to fashion uh, have been yeah especially based in the uae obviously like uh, other other amazing platforms like he has said that is arabic al khalij whatever they are in arabic so there is no representation problem in the teams but it's been going on for a long time and people have been talking about it but not doing much us uh, we did our little uh, we did our little uh, adventure on our own just because it seemed normal to us and now the kids are angry which i understand uh but it's not so, it's it's our daily life you know what i mean they they're being angry about something that we've been living on a daily basis and that we try to correct in our own little way by having a very representative media and i'm curious to know where it will take them i want to join sofia on um, on the hashtag and and recent movement we've we've seen like you said on on social media and also talking uh, about it you know like just before leaving dubai i i i used to go three times a week to to our office in d3 and what i saw physically happening when i was um talking about what was happening on social network was more oh but it was due to happen and and this is i'm talking about designers i'm talking about entrepreneurs like us that are in the 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 the, the d3 uh, business park and every single person that i've met the first thing after saying hi with and shaking with our elbows and and keeping <laughs> our distance was literally oh my god did you see what happened i said yes i saw um what do you think i said i don't think much because for me like said sofia It was so obvious from the beginning when Sofia contacted us when she had this idea of founding and creating Meal. She worked one year on just the idea. Sofia said from day one, and this was over three years ago in t- 2017, Mimi, I want a representation of Arab media with an Arab voice. She talked about recruiting people that had an expertise and naturally and not limited to that where they were coming from or who they were arab or not they were they just were because they were in our circle she thought first of our first circle and our first circle are young arab representing diaspora or uh, kids that live in UK that been educated from north african parents or palestinian parents origin uh, um you know so it was never an issue it was never a problem so there was no comment from us or uh, reaction to have although we've been mentioned in the hashtag higher hi more arabs as positive uh note saying hey millward is doing this and we thank people for for talking about us but it was never because we were angry that we yeah. hired more arabs in the first place it was because it's natural to do it 
Yeah, because I mean, not only the diaspora. Of course, I I'm not a kid of the diaspora, but but the but the uh, the idea was just like uh, if you're gonna explore Arab the Arab market or Arab youth, then uh, خلاص, you know what I mean? It's like would be very strange for me to have a team of only guys uh, in a women's magazine who can have guys and girls, you know? But you need a little bit of girls to tell you about the experience of being a girl. Uh, and uh, if you're going to write and edit a, a magazine or a campaign uh, catered to the Middle Eastern market, you bet that you need some Arabs to, uh, to, to give you their perspective. And I know that yesterday we've been, we talked a little bit, Roma, you and I, about the impact of the campaigns that we do, um, because Mill is also a creative agency run by, by Miriam. Uh, when we do something, the cast is Arab, the director is Arab, the music is Arab, and you know why we do that? Most of the time, most of the time. Yeah, 90% of the time. Yeah, but uh, we still but, have 10% of bringing right talent on but board. That's nor but that's normal, like, let's, let's not even mention that, you know? Like, the normality is to live within your region and to hire within your region. But the, but the, the fact that our campaigns kind of bring more authentic to the Arab market is because it's made by Arabs. Like, it's easy, no? It's important. The, 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 the work of representation, whether in cinema, TV, or media, is very, very important. You know, one thing that I would like to, to really, really specify here. The word is, should not be representation. Okay, because representation usually is about minorities showing face, so it's about you know, it, 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 it works for other circumstances. Here, uh, I, I, I prefer saying reclaiming our own space. More than the fact that you don't want to call it representation, I agree because you don't want to take us back when we should be actually moving forward. And having said that, I think it's our role today, whether it's Roma, whether it's you, Sophia, or I, to actually, without insulting anyone, bring a little bit more of education because you said culture can be learned, but it's instinct when it comes to uh, Roma being um, of Pakistani origin, of you being a Tunisian and me being a French Algerian originally uh, brought up. So I think it's, we should do our part positively bringing the difference in listening to others. Everybody is allowed to have their own opinion. That's the fact. But does it mean that we should not actually teach more to people without, you know, comment on pourrait dire? How can we say that in a nice way? Yeah, without insulting it's them, a, I just want to bring educate. a bit of culture. Uh, no. I think, um, I think like one of the reasons that people, um, especially in luxury, have been so resistant to changes because they're afraid of how it would be perceived on an international level, you know, like the luxury industry, especially like fashion, fine jewelry. They're, they're just a very traditionalist. They're a traditional industry. You know, they're based upon years of heritage, a way of doing things. But, you know, you guys came in, you created content with, from an Arab perspective that is so clear. It's provocative. It's cultural. It's beautiful. It's luxury. I want to know, you. like, how did the industry at large, like on a global level, receive your vision this is learned behavior i think that our region self-censored you know what i mean as opposed because you see in europe the hqs valentina went to africa or went to morocco chanel went to india to salzburg to cuba to, you know what i mean celebrating other uh, cultures have been, I mean, I can even take you back to the 19th century and Paul Poiret with his Orientalist uh, clothing and, and collections. So celebrating other cultures has been a thing that is actually very chic, right? Uh, we remember Talita Getty and the Gaftans and, uh, and Farah Diba and all of that. Um, I feel, and uh, when I started in 2007, I feel that there was a lot of self-censorship and there was a lot of lack of pride in one's culture. Uh, and the, and the, the people wanted to emulate uh, international fa fashion magazines, but they didn't, even fa they didn't even think of highlighting their own culture as something fresh and new and inspirational. Um, I, I, I always... I don't want to blame others. I want to, I want to tell Arabs, be more proud of what you have. 
support your uh, craftsmanship, support your culture. You know what I mean? Don't try validation. And what happened, and also it's a very complicated conversation because the UAE has its own hist history. Saudi has a different one. Tunisia has a different one. UAE, as we said, is a land, is a crossroads of, of, of nationalities. So maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's more difficult to claim that Arab language or Arab visual language. However, it's very new that people started to tap into their culture uh, as, as, a, as a token of pride. But you know there is a misconception. Coming from the brand side, being on the others running a creative agency, I think, without any pretension, that we got to say to the brand when we started Mir about what they didn't want to receive and what they were afraid of. I worked with beautiful HQs in Paris, in Milan. When you have a creative director that has been assigned and deals with 56 countries around the world and Middle East being part of the emerging market like they call it today and is under EMEA, what is it that you see? You see potential, you see a client that is diverse, you see a lot of people also coming from sub-Asian continent and Asia, um, going through the Middle East being a great hub, and I'm talking pre-2016 because we all know what happened after that, where people started struggling, retail started changing, e-tailers e and e-commerce platform of brand were born most of them only now, when you think of it, when um, during the outbreak, when they realize we're struggling, bring a mortar is still there, but uh, the malls are closed, there is a problem. Their first fear creatively, talking to us at the marketing side, learning our curve or being more senior, is not that they didn't trust their team. We were good enough to represent the brand locally on events, on inviting clientele, on bringing them to trunk shows to the store and to distribute and dispatch beautiful content to uh, the local scene uh, of newspaper, media, online, when there was online starting 2010, 2012. But the first thing that we, people would say, and Sophia was one of the person I was interacting when she used to be on the other side as a creative journalist, uh, amazing stylist. And I used to the brand and I would be like, Sophia, I want to do a few pages and this and that. She would bring with amazing ideas, but we would have to run it from HQ. It's not a bad thing. It was just people taking a step back, having local partners saying, we want to do our own campaign. Sometimes it was too early and I agree with the HQs. Sometimes it's because they've seen things that have been done without naming anyone. Some local campaigns that have been done have not been done right fully, not following the uh, DNA, the guideline of the brands. You could do so if you show respect to the brand, showing them that you find an angle, that you find a way to link the message. If you don't have a message to deliver to your local community, whether they are Arab expat, Irish, French, um, uh, Indian, Pakistani, or national, local people, Emirati, Khaliji, uh, Saudi, Bahraini, uh, and you name it, even them will not recognize themselves in the local content. If you do not do content just to uh, please a, a local distribution of newspaper or, or a magazine, you do it because you feel there is an ROI. You feel you want to give back. Your obligation of result is not to sell, but is to deliver a message that will sell and create footfall back to the store, back to the e-commerce. And this, at the end of the day, is for me, and I know I've heard so many times my bosses, oh, you want to create an advertorial, a paid advertising campaign, but we already have a global campaign. No, I want to create a movement. I want to create something different. I want to transcend. I want people to talk mm. about it. I want people yeah. to be proud of. Uh, and I don't want to actually uh, remove the global campaign. The global campaign that I see today is amazingly done and could be actually living together. And this is what we've done with Burberry. This is what we've done with Gucci. Being able to have the trust directly of HQs in London, in Milan, our, during our days now at Mil, it shows that we've sent the right message. Maybe they are not huge campaign, but they're a continuous campaign. Whether they are white well, label, they, whether they, they are... They've been... 
they've been very successful, to be honest. And I think they are. Honest, they are. Burberry is a good example. Uh, Burberry, but Dior as well, etc. And I think they've yes. been hugely successful also because they have this Arab flair that rings authentic. There is a difference, yeah. and one of one of the the topics of hire more Arabs is the difference between representation and tokenism. And um, and you see it when it's fake. You see when a brand is being is being a bit phony with you, right? And it's the same for your local campaigns. You see it when it's done. Um, in a disrespectful way, you see it when, once again, the Arab consumer is seen as passive and not a creative uh, person, which has been one of the biggest claims of, of Hire More Arabs, saying, stop tokenizing us, we're not just wallets, we're creative people, we're professionals. As I said, I've been in this industry 13 years, and I'm even more, actually, but I've been working in the Middle, in the Middle East 13 years, and I never had a problem finding amazing, amazing talent to hire. So I wanted to actually ask that this is something that we touched upon a little bit earlier, but like the Middle East luxury growth has been stagnating for a few years now. And yes. the pandemic has only made things worse. Would you say that a more diverse perspective could be the solution needed to drive growth? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Could you elaborate? Uh, the, of course. Uh, the, 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 this model of hiring talent from abroad is not sustainable because as uh, the trends show and as I think uh, it's a good thing that is happening, it's called, you know, thinking global, but uh, communicating and acting local. Right. And so, as I told you, the reader, uh, the viewer knows when it's authentic to them or not. So the more um, Arabs you're going to hire in your team, the more creative um, outlet you're going to find because it's a different culture and they can bring you a, a completely different narrative to what you've been doing. And the more, uh, uh, you know, uh, unique, you know, a product, whether it's a media fashion, etc., uh, the, the better it will be received. So I think that this whole, like, uh, homogenization of, of, of fashion media in the Middle East, where you open every single magazine looks the same, talks about the same general things, uh, is the downfall. However, uh, we've seen that there is a shortage of, a shortage of Arabs in uh, media teams. Bringing Arabs in will totally uh, make it more perennial, more creative, more authentic, and hence more successful financially and also uh, culturally. Roma, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to jump on what uh, Sophia just said, because Please. I feel, um, Sophia, you brought us the journalistic and media point of view. Um, I want to bring the more economic uh, marketing point of view or, oh, or, or, or general management point of view, because what I retain from the past weeks is um, things that were said that for me were not that true, because few years ago, people like me, people like Josette Awad, um, were on the top of heads of French houses yeah. running teams um, that were diverse. Yeah. And we were at the decision-making positions for years. And nobody noticed it in a way, but I noticed it like for over 10 years. Uh, uh, take Ayman before launching the Quad or Imagination, the company he had before with Deepesh. He was uh, one of the head of Villa Moda. Uh, people tend to forget that 10 years ago, we had already Arab people at great position in retail running the business. Jonah Haas used to be my boss. He's Lebanese originally from the mm -hmm. UK uh, and is today the head of Tiffany. So people are, I, I feel, are mixing. Uh, in this point of view on general management, and you still have a great percentage in the luxury industry or in general any industry where um, business is run by Arab or Arab origin uh, managers, directors. And I yeah. think we should also not forget that. We're just pointing at uh, why French houses, jewelry houses or Italian houses or are running business with people that are not Arab. Maybe they didn't find the right talent compared to what Mead is doing or other titles are doing in the media. But I do believe that 
to be given the chance, you need just to also show that you're capable. Yasmina Khouja is the GM of uh, Chopard. She's a, a French lady uh, with a Tunisian origin mm -hmm. uh, and knows, uh, like married to a, a Saudi gentleman. We, we had so many talent that are there and running the business, but we tend to forget them. On the other side, yes, some houses still believe that sometimes bringing people from their HQ because they know the house, because they know the heritage, no, because they know fair. the brand fair. itself. That's fair. That's fair. Of course, Cartier has people who travel all over the world. You have people uh, one day they're in Singapore, next day they're in China, and the other day they're in Dubai. We're talking but it about takes the time media. to teach. Completely. Lele, but not only. Different. Not only. No, not only because you I know? can talk for people today that were on the brand side that I see potential with to run. Uh, uh, those businesses, and I don't see yeah. them being pushed out there. Why not? But you know, Miriam, of course, I, I'm going to jump in and say that, like, I've worked with, like, I worked for a lot of like luxury brands, either as yes. they were my clients or I worked in house. And one of the things I saw, um, despite how it wasn't so much about the leadership here yes. on the ground, it was a little, it was quite a bit of hesitation of getting approvals on getting being able to create localized campaigns um mm. it, yes, it was just for sure. it, there was a lot of kind of we would always try and a lot the majority of the time sadly the answer would be a no and that's exactly what i'm trying to touch upon is like you know whether it's in on the brand side or whether it's in publishing do you think that a more diverse perspective coming out could be the solution to kind of getting the economy stimulated again or like, you know, the industry stimulated so. to get people I to connect so. and convert. I, I, I think so. But you need a percentage. You need you need a balance into that. You know, like I was saying earlier today with you, ladies, mm -hmm. is you in order for them to accept as well, uh, you need to acknowledge that a global campaign is amazingly beautiful also on our billboards and, and give a representation of the market showing all those brands with their main characters or a main icon representing them globally and also being put on Dubai Billboard or Jeddah, Riyadh and, and elsewhere. And then if you want to have a small representation, just I think you, you should grow with it and go slowly. You can't just arrive and say, I want 100% of my localized campaign no, to be out there. Completely. And you, you need to acknowledge that without the presence of a global visually appealing campaign, you wouldn't get the idea of running a smaller campaign or a local campaign, if so, you agree. So how did you convince, say, for example, I'm going to touch upon one of my favorite campaigns that you guys did as Emil, was that Dior campaign. Um, I think it was Autumn Winter 19 collection where you had the white horse face off with um, that Tunisian As model. As man. Exactly. It was just so powerful, you know, and it was set to this beautiful Arab contact. You had, it was so Dior. How did you convince them? You know why you remember it? You know, uh, because, because it's different. You remember it because we put Arab music. And I think this era and the belly was dancing the element that you and the belly to. dancing element, and it was very oriental in a way that was non cliche. And one of the reasons why is because again the whole team was Arab, absolutely everyone, even the assistants. Uh, and so we knew what we were doing, and we knew how to celebrate our culture in a non cliche way and in a, no a modern way. That's one thing, and that's uh, honestly that's. Uh, you know, um, that's luck also. We just created a beautiful thing and, and that's it. But the other thing that we've done, uh, Miriam and I, is since uh, the early 2000s, we've been claiming our space as both highly trained professionals and Arabs. And there are not a lot of people who can, you know, kind of advance this kind of resume, unfortunately. Because early, early on, I remember I was the only Arab girl in English-speaking media in Dubai. The only. There was no one else. There was Jamila Halfishi, uh, Halfishi uh, for... Uh, Leila Hamdawi. Uh, Leila, Leila Hamdawi. You had those girls, but they were... Um, based part in London. Of right? Arabic. Uh, based in London, but they were part of Arabic magazine. So, of course, you know. But for English-speaking media, uh, there was only me, you know. And uh, for a few years. 
Yeah. And so I always kind of like with brands, I always was like, hey, I'm the one who knows a bit the market. I'm the one who can explain to you what are the eight traditions, etc. Because it's true what uh, Miriam says. Miriam was there since the beginning. Josette Awad was there since the beginning. Yes, Mina Khoja was even at the Grisogono and the Harry Winston. Mm-hmm. All those Arabs were there. But the truth is that the whole, in terms of percentage, uh, they were well, they were mostly uh, Europeans, not even like other nationalities. And you had to explain to them, this is how we consume during Eid. This is taboo. This is cliche, etc. And I was a bit like the only voice for that. Um, in English uh, speaking media again, huh? not Arabic media. Yeah. May Badr has been there. Like, of course, those are our torchbearers and the people we, we that today I'm very proud to stand on, on their shoulders. The giants I stand um, on, on, on their shoulders. But uh, uh, the, the, the truth is the fact that we nurtured this idea of saying, hey, we're super highly trained. We have an amazing network. We uh, we uh, we know exactly how it works, right? Yeah. Makes the and then we come and we're like, you know what? It's 2019. It's time to localize your content. It's time to do something a bit more daring. Then they will trust you. And this is what I want the new generation of Arab professionals, all those people from Ella's list, you know, yeah. is to claim both their Arab identity and higher uh, level of professionalism at the same time. Uh, not to be treated as token, just like the Arab uh, uh, Abaya designer, because you need Arab representation in your magazine, but also not only as a professional, because you bring that Arab flair. And I think this is the recipe for success. Can I ask your opinion on one thing? You brought up tokenism. How do we yeah. move away from tokenism actively and you know, really embrace representation towards a place where it becomes... Um, an inherent part of our identity that is no longer a representation anymore. Hire more Arabs and, and, and then the people that they will choose will less be tokenized because they will come from a, a concerted decision uh, according to what the market wants. I'm not out here saying people should be fired. I am against cancel culture. It's very harsh for them to hear that. I, I, I can understand that they are really panicking and I, my, my heart goes out to them. Plus. Some of them are part of my ex-colleagues, right? What I would do, however, is I would really, really hire more Arabs, guys. Like, it's time. Let me just add something that is very important to me, please. Of course. Uh, If we were talking about magazines in the UAE. Yeah. Okay? 60% Southeast Asians. 32% 32% uh, Emiratis and Arabs in general, uh, Syrians, Tuni- uh, Tunisians, <laughs> we're a small country, Syrians, Moroccans. Uh, <laughs> I love how she puts Kuwait. Tunisians in there. <laughs> yeah, no, very important. She tries, she tries, yeah. she tries. I tried I it, I tried it. But we're, we're very loud, you know, so we make a lot of noise, we, we appear. Um, uh, so you have 32%. The rest, like Westerners, including uh, Russians and uh, uh, Asians, that's 13%. And then you have, um, uh, then you have, whatever. I'm sorry. You, you, you She's not good with numbers. numbers. She's can, really not good I with numbers. Wikipedia, whatever. Uh, you, you can go ahead with, and, and check that. If yeah. we were talking only about the UAE, then I would love to see this population represented in the masthead of magazines, meaning 60% Southeast Asian, 32% Arabs, etc. Okay, this is not me claiming hiring more Arabs in the UAE, the UAE because actually the UAE is a land and, and Sheikh Maktoum and Sheikh Nahyan, they, 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 they promote this and love yeah. this. It's a crossroads. However, if your magazine is pan-Arabic, we're 450 million. So you need to hire more Arabs, please. That's a really, really great perspective. And I think one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of um, publications based in the UAE often forget their pan-Arab reach. Mm. Um, so it's really interesting that you bring that up and you address that, uh, that the population outside of the UAE uh, uh, you know, th- that you're reaching is even bigger than, say, the one within the UAE. And that's yeah. really a great way to increase your kind of whether it's readership or your client base, is to target a more pan-Arab audience, 
isn't it? But you, you know, Roma, you, you bring, like, I agree that the, the, the point that Sophia brought was really good, as usual. Um, <laughs> so I was saying, this representation that Sophia was telling us about with Wikipedia and the numbers is already there within, if you notice, businesses compared to media. Again, I always try, you know, to see the different point of view. And it's been really well applied in UAE in particular, like you said, Sophia, because of our uh, great leaders, uh, their excellencies, um, pushing for more diversity. I want to remind also our audience that nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. And Sophia knows that. <laughs> but, it's, but it's a work in progress. The, the difference also is you can be called out for a mistake. We can publish something that offends people. Okay, yeah, we will. It's live. Uh, but, but what we're calling out a systemic issue, and it's a bigger than just like one simple mistake. We're no, I calling agree. Out a whole system that needs to change. But you this know, is why yeah, consumer and brands are reacting differently to yeah. subject we bring on meal, content we create on have, meal, or for others sometimes. Can, can you elaborate on how people are reacting differently? Could you we, maybe we, tell we, us how that's? Like what you yeah, we, we had the chance to see directly audiences coming up to us, writing to us. Uh, rarely we have um, offensive comments or commentary that, you know, we would have hard time to deal with. And the opposite, we have people that are actually asking us how we do this. This is what makes us different today. I'm not saying we're better than anyone else. I'm not saying... No, we're proud. Exactly. We come proud. We go to Milan to the Gucci offices and we're like, hi, we're the, we're the Arab cousins. This is what we can bring, you know, different. Because you're Gucci. We can never do anything better than you guys. You have much more money, much more power, much more everything. But what we can bring you is our creativity, our culture, our perspective. Let's do a, a vintage uh, Egyptian movie uh, in, an, uh, in a saloon, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is what we can bring. And I think also it's, it's true for for everyone in general, like play your cards right. But do you think back in the day, like we're talking about 2007, because mm -hmm. I grew up here, obviously, and like uh, Dubai, uh, the UAE. OK, I, I say Dubai mm -hmm. because Dubai is really kind of the city that everyone knows eh, most globally, right? It yeah. didn't really start coming into like international awareness properly, mm -hmm. um, especially within the fashion arena until around that was the time. So do you think that was the reason why they kind of, ex you know, exported their talent to Dubai to set up the, uh, the brands over here? Um, I, I think because they were Westerners in the beginning, it was much easier for them to hire within, you know, their own communities. Um, also, I think that Dubai was, uh, especially Dubai, not the whole UAE, of course, yeah. uh, but was uh, uh, publicized as... Uh, you know, a bit like Singapore, you know, like that that uh, city that is super international, that is buzzing with a lot of cultures. So yeah. um, uh, bringing expats was encouraged. Uh, there is a little bit of that notion that, uh, again, is is stemming out of, of, of colonialism that says a white person can do it better regardless of the job. Yeah, there is also a very important notion that uh, within our culture, being a journalist is not the mo necessarily or being an artist uh, pushed. Yeah. Uh, it comes also from the fact that uh, our education system doesn't have very uh, prestigious uh, journalism or fashion schools at the time. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a mix of everything, but it never prevented them from finding aptitude uh, within the local market and nurturing aptitude that 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 is easy that is free you know even take like uh, interns you can you can hire your expats from the uk for the time being and then hire uh, you know uh, more within uh, within the local uh, people uh, and, and train them from within which ha was never done uh, the first covers uh, featuring arab people came 5 6 years later so it's a whole different mentality. They were completely into the globalization uh, as opposed to the localization. And they yeah, you're talking, you're that. talking, Sophia, of uh, obviously the covers. English. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the English-speaking uh, title. Okay. Hey, of course, of course. 
why do you think like I came here in 2014 like came back to the UAE and uh-huh. you know that was about the time that D3 was started like getting built you know and there's yeah. been such an explosion of Arab like in the Arab fashion scene um it within that short amount of time that I've been here it's been what six seven years now mm-hmm. like I felt it you, you know, know in like a surge. Who, you know who who I want to thank for this shell hoop group an entire group you know why because before there was representation in uh, when i arrived in 2007 uh, so you had miriam was already in place josette as we said yasmin akhuja i was I when you arrived i was in shalhuba huh? in yeah. my, my first job was at altair in 2014. yeah, there yeah, you go. yeah. so, so uh, 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 there was zero zero arab in media english speaking media and still there is nona i'd like to point that out but that why? in 2020 there is still a very uh, a few you know i can i can count them in on one hand uh, but uh, uh, when I arrived, PRs, marketing directors, merchandisers, they started becoming more uh, Arab, right? Mm-hmm. I, I arrived, they were all white. And then Shalhoub started and Altair, they started hiring within Lebanese, Syrian communities, Emiratis, etc. And they are the ones who spearheaded the Arabization of, of the fashion. But don't forget that there was the emeritization starting in also, 2006 yeah. and 2007, where you had a minimum of percentage that you had to encourage within yeah. private sector. Because yeah. uh, 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 what was great about the Emirates at that time, um, in 20, yeah, in 20, yeah, 2005, 2007, when I arrived, you clearly had the chance to bring on people within your team to make a difference. I remember I used to work with Anthony Chaloub, may rest in peace, and, and Mr. Patrick Chaloub, and, and Madame, and, yeah, and Madame Widat Chaloub uh, for Tanagra, their baby that they started in the 1940s. They were the first one to travel door to door, you know, expressing luxury à la française, mm-hmm. savoir vivre, uh, bringing it mm-hmm. to the Middle East, you know, themselves being French, Syrian origin, beautiful people that until today I admire, like you said, Sophia, thanks to them, this is what diversity brought to us. But yeah, the PRs, the PRs today, they're all like uh, from Arab origin. Before they were all from the UK. And now slowly it's true. you see, you know, everywhere uh, we deal with all the PRs are either Southeast Asian or uh, Arabs, which for me is, uh, is more representative of what the UAE is today. I think it was also, it was, it was a two pronged um, issue here. One was like, obviously you have to wait for the industry to mature enough to attract that kind of talent Um, and for people to develop, really hone in on their skills uh, regionally. And Mm -hmm. the other one was an education for um, the international fashion and beauty industries who weren't exposed so much to this kind of culture before. It's about, yeah, yeah, it it was just like... To opulence, darling, to opulence. Now they appreciate our opulence, but before they found it a bit too much. Exactly. No, but before we were not minimalist enough for them. We were not minimalist enough. It was, uh, yeah. Mm. But uh, Um, another uh, is a a pioneer that I would like to shout uh, to give a shout out to is Firas Wahabi, who, uh, by the way, uh, is someone when it was you know really the media. I remember uh, brands wouldn't authorize me to mix local brands with their brands, even if it's like a pair of sunglasses, whether the local brand is genius or not, we were not allowed to have like fashion stories with international brands and local brands. And you know who came and was like, you know what, local brands are amazing and they can be viable viable on the international market. He was so damn right because today he represents robbery and fraud that you see on uh, Kim Kardashian, Beyonce, whatever. He represents Lafshar, he represents uh, uh, Madiel Sharky, so many amazing brands. And I'm going to forget some for sure, but I would like Karen to was in... All of them, all of them. He came and he was like, you know what, I'm going to create the best Arab brands. Again, it's important to have pride. So if you have pride, you will not accept mediocrity when it comes to execution of imagery, etc. I'm going to do kick-ass look, look books. I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to show my designers. And he really did that in a time where being an Arab designer wasn't cool. So thank you so much for coming on, guys. I couldn't have done this episode with literally anyone else but you because I respect what you do so much. And um, oh. I couldn't believe when you said yes. I was beyond 
Throw. Thank you so much. We're honored. I mean, are you kidding me? You're honored you thought of us, and we're honored uh, that you gave us, uh, you know, a little chance to introduce our vision. And uh, I apologize for... Uh, <laughs> we had a lot to say, so I apologize <laughs> in advance for the time you're going to take to edit this podcast, but it was truly a pleasure. No, it'll be so worth much. every Same minute. here. Here, thank you so much, Roma, for inviting us. It's such a pleasure to be with Sophia on your curated conversation and cannot wait to actually uh, listening to it next week. Well, uh, thank you so much. Keep in touch. Take care. Thank you, Roma. Thank you. Happy Bye. Monday, everyone. And Bye. Be proud, be proud of and, what and you And visit mealworld.com and check out their amazing content. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you, Roma. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and if you did, please make sure you hit subscribe and leave us a comment below as we would love to hear from you. Also, be sure to head over to www.curatednow.me and sign up for the official Curated Middle East newsletter. Thanks for listening.